Okay, it's uh, it's three thirty. I'm sorry, we're, we're we're running a little bit late. Um, we're gonna adjust the schedule a bit, and because we have uh, Sam, Sam Rauch, who is um, gonna give us a presentation. Sam's the assistant administrator for regulatory programs, and he's gonna give us a presentation on conserving and restoring uh, the beautiful. And uh, I'm looking at my notes here. So we're gonna we're gonna bump the North Atlantic right whales until after Sam goes. And Sam, um, if you can hear us, uh, you can hear me. Thanks thanks for being here with us today, and uh, we'll look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is this still coming through? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Great, thanks. Yes, I'm Sam Rock. I'm the deputy director of the National Marine Fisheries Service in charge of regulatory programs. I'm going to give you a brief overview today of the administration's report on the 30 by 30 initiative. Uh, the report is conserving and restoring America the beautiful. Uh, and I'll try to, to reserve some time for questions at the end uh, within the 30 minutes we have a lot. So if we could skip down to the next slide, please. We have the next slide. So on the first days of this, go back. On the first days of this administration, we go back here. Um, the president signed executive order 14008, which contains a lot of material, but it, it significantly included section 216A, which outlines what is colloquially known as the 30 by 30 uh, endeavor. So what this report this executive order required is that the Secretary of Interior in consultation with a number of agencies, including Commerce Department, is to submit a report to the Climate Task Force, which is established elsewhere in the executive order, on um, how to achieve the goal of conserving at least 30% of our land and waters by 2030. So 30% is not an endpoint. It says at least 30%. But we are focusing on achieving conservation outcomes as opposed to necessarily meeting a particular number and the benefits that those outcomes provide over the long term. And we're going to get into that more in a little bit. Uh, the subsection little i uh, does direct uh, NOAA and other federal agencies to solicit input from state, local, tribal, territorial officials, and a number of stakeholders on identifying strategies that will encourage broad participation in the goal of conserving 30%. And we view this discussion with the councils. The councils are actually a key partner in the management of, of fisheries, fishing resources uh, in this in this effort. So this is part of our consultation and solicitation of input from you all. And you all are mentioned specifically in the report. In addition, another section, the little II, says that the report shall propose guidelines for determining whether the lands and waters qualify for conservation and for mechanisms to measure the progress towards the goal. So if we can go on, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next slide on uh, our preliminary outreach and go straight to the interagency report. So this report was issued a couple of months ago on May 6th. It re it's the first step in the process of soliciting public and stakeholder input on the strategy for achieving the conservation goals. And importantly, it sets out three broad goals that we're trying, that this is all patterned around. It's all trying to achieve. One is to combat the loss of natural areas and resources. Two, the threat of climate change and three disparities in access to the outdoors. Each so rather than focus on 30% as a number, we're trying to achieve conservation to meet these three broad, uh, these three broad goals. And it's a 10 year locally led nationally scaled campaign. Which we'll talk about more in a minute, but important at the outset is the report explicitly recognizes the need for a continuum of approaches. It intentionally uses the term conservation as opposed to other terms such as protection, because it acknowledges that the value of various conservation actions, in addition to protected action areas, can assist in meeting those goals. And the actions, the number of actions explicitly discussed in the report are including marine protected areas, but also ecosystem restoration and areas that allow for sustainable mixed use. Because the federal agencies are seeking input on how to measure progress toward the 30% goal, at this point, there's been no specific conservation actions that are either included or excluded from this discussion. If I can have the next slide. 
So the report lists eight separate principles, and I'm not going to go over them in depth in each one, but it is basically designed to build a bottom up effort as opposed to a federally mandated top down effort to recognize locally led efforts that benefit all the people, not just a subset of the people in terms of particularly access, but other other issues that can derive from conservation. The report talks a lot about the job creation opportunities, the job preservation opportunities from creating these, these managed areas. And the council knows well how it is important to protect certain habitat in order to maintain the coastal and marine economy, uh, particularly the fishing economy, but not just the fishing economy, other kinds of issues. If we don't protect the habitat on which that economy is based, then we won't be able to either maintain jobs, but there's a huge potential for creating new jobs and new economic uh, incentives out of conservation efforts. Importantly, the effort is supposed to honor existing private property rights and recognize voluntary stewardship efforts to build trust among the community and stakeholders, um, particularly private landowners. So we'll, you know, I understand we're talking to the councils, we're focused on the ocean issues. There is a large portion of this effort that is focused on land conservation and private landowners and preserving their rights and encouraging them to voluntarily participate in this effort. Um, and that is one reason why the uh, the uh, report takes a fairly broad view of what could or, be, or could not be included in, in the conservation mandate here. It is supposed to be guided by science and it is supposed to build on existing tools. This national conservation goal is ambitious, but we currently across the board, including council measures, have a wide range of tools that we use to achieve conservation objectives. Sometimes they align with those three conservation objectives that the president laid out at the very beginning. Sometimes they achieve somewhat slightly different conservation objectives. They're all valid conservation approaches. The, the challenge for us will be looking at all of these various efforts and all the purposes for which they're created and trying to determine how they contribute to the three broad scale goals that I laid out at the very beginning. Back it up the next slide. So the report was issued, was the first step. It discusses a number of strategies. The first one is to do a baseline assessment. Where are we right now? Where are we on the continuum of 30% uh, by 2030 uh, in order to achieve those three overarching objectives? So there is, uh, the, the report calls for a conservation and stewardship atlas, um, which is supposed to guide where the status quo is, how far away are we from where we want to be? Are we there? Are we over? Um, have we, how close are we to achieving the overarching objectives for which the, 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 this whole effort is designed? This is going to be developed by an interagency federal workforce, uh, but there is going to be input from public states, tribes, scientists, and a wide range of stakeholders, and it's going to consider a range of uh, uh, contributions, including Conservation measures under the Magnuson Act, uh, and I would also extend to our commission partners, if they're still here, conservation measures under the under the Atlantic Coastal Act. Uh, very similar sort of uh, considerations. All of these are going to be considered and evaluated. We all know that they contribute to conservation. The question is, how are they contributing to the three overarching goals that the president has laid out, and then how does that get? calculated in terms of the overall, where are we in terms of 30%? Are we there below it or over it? And where do we need to go to try to meet the president's objectives? And finally, on this on this topic, the we envision that we will be putting out these reports annually with the first report being done by the end of 2021, which will include a process update on areas of collaboration identified in the report updates on land, on land cover changes, including loss of open space, and a review of the condition of fish and wildlife habitats and populations. So if I could have the next slide, please. The report then identifies six areas of focus to begin making early progress. Recall this is a 10-year initiative. You don't have to achieve it next year. Um, but there are some places that the president would like us to look for some initial early progress. One creating more parks and safe outdoor opportunities in nature-deprived communities. Um, second one is to be very inclusive and outreach into the particular knowledge and needs of, our, of the tribes 
looking at tribally led conservation restoration priorities and facilitating those. Expanding collaborative conservation of fish and wildlife habitat and corridors um, throughout the country. It also explicitly calls for an expansion of the national marine sanctuary system and the national estuarine research reserve system. Both done not by the fishery service, but by our sister agency within NOAA, the National Ocean Service. And then under this in this provision, it explicitly recognizes the work of the regional fishery management councils under the Magnuson Stevens Act. It calls for no, us, NOAA, to work closely with the regional councils to identify areas or networks of areas where their fishery management efforts would support long term conservation goals. We are we are tasked with looking for access for outdoor recreation and not just for a select few, but for all communities. We are trying to incentivize and reward those voluntary conservation efforts of fishermen, ranchers, farmers, and forest owners, even if it's not implemented through binding regulation. And as I mentioned before, we're, we are looking to create jobs. This does mesh in other provisions of the, of the executive orders with the Civilian Climate Corps, which can help conserve and restore public lands and waters, helping to meet that 30% goal, longer term conservation goals. And it does match with the overall vision of the administration that conservation can, um, can lead to, to job creation. So if I go to the next slide, please. So the, uh, the report's the starting point. It started a series of meetings like this meeting we're having here with, the, with your council. Had a meeting with a number of other councils, a number of stakeholder groups. Uh, I believe we were likely to put out a federal register notice soon seeking comment uh, from the broader public. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways in which we're seeking input into the report and the objectives. Next slide, please. So we are we, as I said, the, this is a broad agency uh, federal government effort. Different agencies have different authorities that they're bringing to the table. NOAA has a number of specific authorities that it's bringing to the table. Most acutely for this particular group is the Magnuson Stevens Act and the, the long history of area based management that, that you all support and other councils support. You, know, you have seen a great benefit uh, to protecting various habitats, managing various habitats, um, looking at how those, those a fit within an ecosystem function, both for the natural ecosystems and for social economic dynamics in our coastal economies. So we know that there's a lot of area based management that could meet some of these overarching objectives of the Magnus Act. Um, we also are NOAA is looking at other sort of areas that we manage under the Sanctuaries Act, how you look at areas that states manage under the purview of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, how you look at the MMPA or the ESA, those have in certain areas specialized uh, management areas. And although NOAA does not by default have a management role in the Antiquities Act, a number of the ocean based monuments developed in the Antiquities Act, when the president has developed those, past presidents have developed those, they have given NOAA a clear role in the proclamation. So sometimes we do have management authority under the Antiquities Act, and so those are also for consideration by us in this process. But there's a wide range of conservation actions, both federally mandated, federally encouraged, or just private actions or state actions or local actions that occur that are also relevant to this discussion. If I could have the next and I think the final slide. So this is the, these are the questions that we're seeking input on, both from you all and from the broader community. Um, first, what sort of baseline conservation actions are effective, not just effective, because we know that they're effective, and we know the council looks at for mining site purposes, are these effective at meeting those standards, but are they effective at addressing nature loss, climate change, and disparities in access to the outdoors? Those are the three overarching objectives that we're looking at in this situation. So are those kind of measures that the council takes or others take effective at that? And if so, then how do we include those in the cost in in that or encourage more of that kind of activity if we need to? Um, if there are other kinds of conservation and restoration actions that are not sort of listed out here broadly that we should particularly pay attention to that would meet those three objectives, are there things we should consider? Um, what criteria? 
do we use to identify the areas that are currently uh, subject to conservation? And, and basically, this is what counts for 30 by 30. And if we are below 30 by 30, what would we, where would, should we focus our efforts to try to get at these, you know, what new areas would we do? What new types of conservation would we look at if we believe we still, after we do the baseline analysis, still think that there are further we need to go? And finally, in addition to these sort of meetings that we're having here today, how would we support efforts of stakeholders to engage in conservation and how can we collaborate with stakeholders in this overarching effort? So, Mr. Chairman, that is the presentation. I sped through this. I will note that this is normally an hour long presentation. I've tried to, to shorten it um, so that we can have some time here. And so I apologize if there if I have missed over something that's important, but I believe uh, if there are questions, we can get at some of those issues. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy. Yeah, to thanks. Questions thanks, on Sam. It. No, you don't need to. You never need to apologize. Um, it's a lot of information and I'm going to turn to, uh, the list. Let's see if anyone has their hand up at this point. I've got Joe Samino and, uh, Sam, thanks for the presentation. Uh, hopefully we'll get some good, uh, comments and, and, um, questions for you. So Joe Samino, go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Sam. I, I just we had a good discussion with you at ASNFC about um, increasing diversity in the management world, and I, I appreciate the the goal of increasing access for everyone here. And uh, I can say New Jersey DEP is a strong supporter of that as well. I uh, <laughs> instead of answering questions for you, <laughs> unfortunately, I may have another for you, and that's about new areas or or, or existing areas, and and the fact that we are living through an, a changing environment with climate change. And I guess I, I wonder, have you thought about a mechanism that perhaps the new areas or set aside areas may need to be moved, especially, you know, and I'm thinking in the marine environment instead of just staying static, is there a mechanism for dealing with that? Well, with, with uh, your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do think that particularly when you look at climate change, climate change, we know the stocks are shifting. And so that challenges us um, to look at the habitat as well. Is the habitat that they rely on, is it also shifting? Do you need to assess habitat needs of a new species because stocks are shifting into an area that is more vulnerable, that does not have conservation measures there? All these are relevant questions as we are dealing with the dynamic system. I think you want to to look at this, um, the places that are here for conservation, and ask that very question: Is it should it be static for all time, or does it need to be flexible somewhat to address new needs, new climate needs? Do you need refugia for where things are going to end up, uh, even if they're not there now? So I think these are all questions and they're all re related or raised by climate change because we know that climate change is causing or contributing at least to shifting stocks. And that raises a host of questions about how you can adaptively manage the habitat underneath and the area underneath to, to meet those needs. So I don't have an answer for you either other than I think that is a question we're gonna have to, to struggle with, with I think the idea is that these this list is not permanent. It's an annual list. It's a continuous evaluation with the idea that that there will be some changes in uh, what is or is not included as we decide what we need to do as our knowledge develops about climate change and shifting ecosystems. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, I did get a text. Uh, Tony, before I go to you, I'm going to go to Peter Hughes. He is on the phone only, so he's going to. Um, Peter has had a comment he wanted to make. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound good. Okay, okay great. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Sam, for uh, updating us on that, uh, that important information. I have a couple of questions. My first one you might not be able to answer because I think it's early in the process. 
But do you know how wind energy areas would be looked at in this entire process or would this would this committee um, that you spoke of um, being uh, would they be the ones trying to answer those questions? Well, with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, the uh, the report does not speak specifically to wind energy areas, so there's no preconceived notion of that. Um, you would have to look at what is the uh, what is the impact of the area. What are you trying to conserve? You know, um, in terms of that management, maybe you can't fish there, but you also are having a bottom disturbing impact. How does that balance out? Um, you know, the report looks at a wide range of areas both on the ocean and on land and does talk about mixed use. And so I, I do think that areas in which you address one particular use like fishing, but don't address other particular uses, how do we balance that out? Do we have to have authority and protect all, you know, deal with all uses? The report doesn't say it is something we're going to have to deal with both on the ocean where you might have the ability to do that and on land where Maybe you don't, particularly if you're engaged in voluntary efforts with, with stakeholders, or maybe it's easier because you have landowners. So these are difficult questions about how many uses would you have to control or manage? I don't, not necessarily prohibit, but manage to meet those goals and how do they interact? Uh, the report does not predecide that, and we are interested in any views on that. Uh, but the report does talk about sustainable uh, about taking action in sustainable mixed use areas as as recognizing the the beneficial effect those actions can have on the conservation. Thank you. I'm I'm appreciative of that answer. And and then I have one more question, and it and it might be a silly question, but I I haven't read through the executive order myself, um, but. Are, are we looking at, you know, 30 by 30 in federal waters, 30 by 30 in state waters, 30 by 30 on land, or is it a cumulative look at 30 by 30? Yes, the executive order says conserving the goal of conserving at least 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. It doesn't say 30% in federal waters only. Clearly it's talking about lands and waters. Um, we have not decided how you actually implement that, where it's a, whether it's a singular uniform national standard or whether it is somehow more uh, broken out in terms of lands and waters or regionally or those kind of issues. I would encourage you, though, to uh, this is why I started this way. The report does talk. I mean, the 30, the 30 by 30 is the goal the president has laid out, but the president has laid it out for a reason to achieve three overarching objectives. And so I think that's what we need to look at, or that's, I mean, that's the lens I look at it through, is determining how you do the math. It's a, there's a math problem in here, but it really gets to this natural resource problem. Are we dealing with not loss of natural areas and resources? Can you deal with climate change? What is, what is the scale that we need to look at to do those? And disparities in access to the outdoors. Um, but the the executive order itself does not mention a preconceived distinction between land or water or anything that would suggest of a subdivision, like you have to do 30% in the mid-Atlantic and 30% in the West Coast. It doesn't talk about that. It just lays out that standard that I read, which is a national 30%, at least 30% goal. Well, look, I, I appreciate your answer, Sam, and I will... Uh endeavor to go through that report or that executive order. Um, and th thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I will yield. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And thanks, uh, Sam, for that uh, response to that question. I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to we're going to move on. Uh, maybe I'll, you know, if we have time, we can go to the public quickly. Uh, Tony Delernia. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sam, uh, you, you've seen my proposal regarding uh, climate change and shifting stocks. You've seen my proposal regarding how to maintain the integrity of each individual council, yet giving voting authority to uh, non-member you know, states the authority to vote on particular species. 
I've submitted that uh, proposal to both uh, to the agency and to the White House and to elected officials. And I hope that uh, as you go forward, you give that uh, proposal some serious consideration because uh, as sh uh, stocks shift, we're going to have to uh, recognize the ability of fishermen to be able to manage those stocks in their offshore waters. Thank you, Sam. I have seen that proposal, but we don't have a position on it. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, thanks for the for the comment, Tony. And uh, yeah, if, if the agency doesn't have a position, um, I understand not not you know speaking to it. Um, I just got a I just got a text from Chris Moore. Chris, do you have a question? Good, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Sam. Just a quick one. Um, Sam, you mentioned an FR notice. What's the what's the timing of that, and what's going to be in that FR notice? I don't know the exact timing of that at the moment, but I would imagine in the next uh, few weeks or so. Um, and it's just going to be a solicitation on these sort of questions that we've identified here. It's not going to, I do not believe it'll have any new information. And in fact, it'll probably have a lot less information than I've just shared with you. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. So you're good, you're good Chris, on that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, hands from from council members? Let me go to the let me go to the audience um, really quickly. Anyone from the public that wants to ask a question for Sam? I see Greg. Go ahead, Greg Didamen. Greg Didamenico, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Rob. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. It's Greg Didamenico from Lunds Fisheries. Um, to the issue of uh, loss of access. I know one of the key um, outcomes of 30 by 30 is identified uh, where the public has lost access to some of these resources. Do you have any idea what that really means or where those areas are? Um, it would be helpful to know what they're talking about. Thank you. I, I don't have any particular notion of where specific areas are. If you look at this in the context with a number of the other executive orders that came out both in this one and the other one, there is a definitive view of this administration that uh, there are a number of underserved communities that have traditionally not been given equitable access to resources, whether we're talking about natural resources in this in this order or other kinds of resources. And uh, that long-term historic inequity is something that the administration is interested in addressing and fixing through this, and that's why that's one of, of the goals here. Um, we do know that there are certain actions that people take that make areas shorelines are not accessible uh, to fishermen. Areas that were traditionally uh, fished by underserved communities are no longer accessible for whatever reason. Or, you know, we, we alter the habitat such that they're not, they may be accessible, but they're not productive. So I don't have a list of where these areas are. We're interested in where these areas might be. Certainly as we are looking to develop new conservation areas, this is a very good reason for developing new conservation areas, which is to try to address some of this historical inequity. Mindful that this whole process is not necessarily a top down thou shalt effort, but it is trying to support uh, efforts and the locally led efforts, more regionally based efforts to deal with it. So where local or regional entities want to engage in conservation to correct some of these historical inequities, we are tasked with trying to facilitate that and help. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, based on your comment, um, Greg, I, you don't have a follow up. You're good. All right, hearing nothing. Um, I'm going to go back. Let me ask. Let me ask the uh, the audience one more time. Is there anyone from the public that wants to ask a question of Sam? All right, seeing no hands, I'm going to come back to the board, um, or come back to the council. Um, there's no action needed here, and Sam, we we really appreciate your time. Um, to present this information and 
Uh, I, I just want to thank you for being here with us. Uh, but I, I don't see any other hands for questions and comments. So uh, I think you're off the hook. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks, Sam. We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll talk soon. Okay with that. Um, I would like to take a five minute break and we'll come back at 4, 4.05 and we'll pick up uh, on the rest of our agenda for the afternoon. Um, thank you all. Hi, this is Colleen. Quick sound check. Hey, Colleen, you sound good. Great, thanks. Hey, Colleen, this is Mike. Um, I just wanted to thank you for uh, pushing off your um, your presentation to, to let Sam go first. Um, but we're happy to have you, and I think it's four oh five. I, I I don't even remember what I said before, but I think I think four oh five is when we talked about trying to get back together. Um, 
as a group. And so, Pauline, if you're, I know you have a number of other people with you uh, as part of this dis uh, discussion. Uh, I'll recognize you at this point, but um, if you're if you're ready to take on um, the presentation, then it's all you. Sure, we can get started if that works. All right, thanks, Colleen. Yeah, it sounds good. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for making some time for us because I know your agenda has been busy. And yes, I do have Marissa Trago on the phone with me at least till 430. Uh, Marissa is our take reduction team coordinator for GARFO and uh, have also had help putting this together from Crystal Franco, Jen Gogol and Chow Zo, who are our, our take reduction team out of GARFO. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our next steps in modifying the Atlantic large whale take reduction plan. I'll give a quick recap and I will try to make a quick of where we are with our current rulemaking effort and a longer discussion on the phase two modifications to the plan that we're just initiating now. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick reminder that under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we implement take reduction process when a marine mammal stock uh, is undergoing incidental mortality or serious injury in US commercial fisheries that are above the potential biological removal level that's prescribed by the act. Um, although the Atlantic large whale take reduction plan is geared toward mitigating impacts to all the Atlantic large whales, because the potential biological removal level for the North Atlantic right whale is less than one mortality or serious injury a year, the plan really focuses primarily on reducing impacts on right whales. And under that take reduction team process, we work with a stakeholder group, the take reduction team, to develop and recommend take reduction measures. And we work towards trying to get consensus recommendations from the group, but if they don't come to consensus in the end, NIMS is still required to implement the modifications to the plan to reduce the takes to below the PBR or potential biological removal level. Uh, your member on the team is Carson Coutre, and we thank her. And a number of other team members are actually on the phone today with us or on the call today. Uh, thank them as well. We've been working really hard uh, this year and the end of last year, and um, we really appreciate the high engagement that we're getting. The team is made up of uh, 60 people, including 18 fishermen. There's a member from each state, and each Atlantic Council and the Commission also have a member on the team as well. Uh, the plan was first developed in 96. It's gone through a lot of modifications since that time, and today it basically includes regulations to modify fixed fishing gear, such as uh, seasonal restricted areas, there are gear marking requirements, and there are other measures intended to reduce mortality and serious injury right whales, fin whales, humpback whales, and minke whales that are incidentally taken into fisheries. But despite all the work that's been done by, by the team, by U.S. fishermen and others participating in right whale recovery efforts, a paper that was published in 2017 demonstrated that the right whale population has been in decline really since 2011, and serious injuries and mortalities caused by entanglements are continuing at levels above PBR. So in response to that and following input from the team, uh, the New England states and the public, we've developed a rule currently in review in OMB that would reduce the risk to right whales in the Northeast lobster and Jonah crab fishery by greater than 60%. Uh, we're really here to talk about the further rulemaking, but just to also let you know that that rule, uh, we do hope will be, um, will be released within the next month, if not the next few weeks. Next slide, please. I appreciate you running the slides. I have intermittent connectivity today, so hopefully I'll stay on. Um, so as I said, the population has been de in decline since 2010. Uh, the top part of this slide, that green trend line, shows that after 2010, the population decline was kind of gradual. It accelerated quickly after 2017. In the lower section of the graph, uh, it's on a different scale, but you can see the mortality estimates represented by the orange trend line, and then the blue graphs, uh, uh, the blue bars are the number of births. Uh, nearly all of the observed mortalities are human caused, largely entanglement and vessel strikes in the US and Canada. And um, that makes us uh, have to conclude that those estimated mortalities are also largely human caused. The real difficult thing about um, managing right whales is. Uh, particularly entanglements, uh, is that we often see the entanglement or evidence of entanglement injuries way after the entanglement has occurred 
and miles from where it's occurred. So uh, we don't always know where the gear uh, was picked up by the well or where the incident occurred. And that makes it a little bit difficult to manage. Uh, next slide, please. So starting in 2017, NIMS uh, declared an unusual mortality event, which really just lets us bring extra resources to responding to mortality. This slide summarizes the status of the population since 2017. The latest estimate of the population is about 368 right whales uh, as of 2019. Of those, fewer than 100 are considered to be or are likely to be calving females or females old enough to have calves. Since 2017, there have been 52 known mortalities and serious injuries observed, and only 40 calves were born during that same time. So mortalities have continued to outpace births. And that is just the documented or observed mortalities. The estimated mortalities are, uh, in most years, at least twice as many as have been observed. As I said, it's difficult to um, determine where some of those uh, entanglements are occurring. Gears only retrieve from about half of the observed entanglements. And unless the gear is clearly marked or unless the entanglement is anchored, we don't know the site or the source of the rope found on whales. Uh, but since 2017, of the 34 observed mortalities, 10 were documented in the U.S. and 24 in Canada. Nine of those have been entanglement related, four in the U.S. and five in Canada. So we use that term often first seen in the U.S. or first seen in Canada as a proxy for the actual event. In rare cases, we do know um, from the gear where, where it actually occurred. There was also um, uh, 13 incidents where the cause couldn't be determined, and there were 11 vessel strikes during that time, three in the U.S. and eight in Canada. Uh, a perinatal mortality also occurred, and there were 18 serious injuries, which are injuries that we expect to cause mortalities documented during the same time, 11 in the U.S., four in Canada, and 14 of those including nine first seen in the U.S. involved entanglements. Next slide, please. So again, the hard part is determining uh, exactly where the incidents occurred. This graph is showing only documented mortalities and only those uh, that are known to be uh, uh, entanglements or, or documented uh, as entanglements and first seen in the U.S. The the light blue bars are those incidents that were disentangled in U.S. waters where we don't know the country of origin of the entangling gear. The gray bars show the serious injury and mortalities of right whales first seen in U.S. waters. Dark blue or teal uh, shows whales that were disentangled in U.S. waters and known to be in U.S. gear. Black bars are those serious injuries or mortalities known to be caused by U.S. fishing, fishing gear. And um, the white bar is just the 2021 data, which were prelim uh, two entanglements preliminarily identified as serious injuries first seen in U.S. waters this year. The red dots show the population biological removal level. So again, this is just documented takes and those first seen in the U.S. and they are well above the PBR except for in 2013. Next slide, please. And again, in most years since 2010, fewer than 50% of the actual mortalities uh, were observed. So that's a minimum impact. Uh, so uh, considering those data, we gave the take reduction team a minimum risk reduction target of 60% uh, risk reduction that would be required to get us below PBR based on observed take and 80% taking into account uh, the likelihood that a large portion of those unabsorbed mortalities are US commercial fisheries uh, mortalities or serious injuries. This just shows the rulemaking process. We are in the middle of two different rulemaking processes, or we're finishing the first one uh, in the uh, phase one. Uh, we are um, developing those rules, the final rules expected soon for the Northeast lobster and Jonah crab fishery targeted at reducing impacts of the buoy lines in those fisheries. Those fisheries in the Northeast um, fish about 93% of the buoy lines that are fish in areas where right whales occur. And again, uh, the um, FEIS on that was released July 2nd. We will be issuing a record decision after it's finished OMB review and then release, uh, releasing the final rule as well. But we're now engaged in coastwide rulemaking uh, in the very, very preliminary brainstorming stages of coastwide rulemaking or phase two. 
this rulemaking is uh, is going to be targeting those fisheries not regulated in phase one. So that is the mid Atlantic trap pot fisheries, what we call Atlantic mixed species or other trap pot fisheries and gillnet fisheries coastwide. Um, we uh, have filed a notice of intent today. It was filed and tomorrow it will be released. Uh, our public scoping period will go through October 21st. And that is partly so that we can uh, come back to you in October to get your comments or your input on scoping. And um, then we will be working with the TRT this winter. Um, we were hoping for an in-person meeting in November. That's not gonna be possible. We'll hope for in-person or hybrid meeting possibly in January so that the team can uh, look at both uh, updates that we're making to our models that we're using to assess take they will be uh, also looking at what input we got from scoping and they'll start to put together some ideas towards uh, towards creating uh, recommendations. We're hoping to bring them back together. We hope in person March of 2022, at which point we are hoping that they'll be providing us with recommendations for proposed rulemaking. So that's the uh, process we're just initiating really tomorrow with the publication of the notice of intent. Next slide, please. So again, phase one, 60 to 80% uh, risk reduction within the Northeast Lobster Jonah Crab Fisheries, and we expect that final rule shortly. Next, please. The phase two, the star shows where we are right now. Uh, tomorrow, the notice of intent will publish. We'll be scoping. We anticipate having seven uh, virtual meetings, and we'll have a few days that are uh, will just be on the phone like an open phone line for people to call if they don't want to participate in the larger um, remote meetings so we're hoping that way to engage as many people as possible it's really unfortunate that we can't do this in person because uh, in the past we've gotten a lot of our information from fishermen in particular after uh, towards the end of the meeting when they come and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with us um, and then this winter we'll be working with the trt to give them the scoping results Again, uh, still in the brainstorming phase until spring 2022, we hope March, when we hope that the team will be providing us with recommendations. And again, there'll be another opportunity for public comment after we release a draft EIS and a draft proposed rule sometime next year. And we hope to have a final rule in 2023. Next slide, please. So we've been talking to the team this year about a 68% reduction in these other fisheries, these other fixed gear fisheries that are regulated by the plan. The team uh, has been meeting this spring in caucus and cross caucus groups. We uh, were working with them at improving our fishery information model and we worked as well. Our decision support tool is what we call that. The 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 decision support tool team has been working very closely with the states to improve the baseline data that's in that tool that we use to help us assess risk and co-occurrence of right whales with the gear. So thanks to any of the team members that are on or the state folks that were on that helped get data for that. And again, the team has been brainstorming ideas uh, for us to take to scoping to get input. And we don't want to characterize any of those ideas as uh, recommendations from the team. None of them have been vetted for uh, consensus and in, indeed like some of them we know uh, would not have strong consensus, but we're worth going out and getting more information on. And again, we'll be scoping till October 21st. Next slide, please. So the mid-Atlantic fisheries in particular that are regulated under the plan are listed on here, as well as the affected fisheries in the mid-Atlantic. Um, it, you know, in scoping, we are hoping to be getting input. So these are the fisheries that we're hoping to get input from you on uh, in any scoping comments or, or input that you provide. And uh, we'll work with Carson on, on this as well. Next slide, please. So we, again, we had a draft decision support tool that we were working with the team on just to initiate or get their ideas started uh, and also to get their input on where there may be data lacking or where the decision support tool data didn't seem to line up with what they knew. And we're still working on getting the uh, updates 
Uh, we hope to have them all to the team by early November. And uh, as they're updated, we'll be bringing updated slides to scoping as well. Um, this uh, one thing we did provide them with to, so that they could just get an idea of the size of the problem was, uh, you know, kind of area by area hotspots. And these are areas where either co-occurrence of right whales and gear or where we could tell risk of right whales and the gear was um, was highest. So this image, which is a little bit hard to read, uh, shows for the Gulf of Maine where coastwide, um, where, where hot spots within the top 60% of risk for the entire coast uh, overlap with the gillnet fishery, where that occurred. And uh, primarily, again, hard to see, it's in um, really October, November, December, January, uh, in these offshore statistical zones, 513 and 515 primarily. Um, again, uh, this will be updated. There would probably be more state data um, showing up in some of these slides, but that's uh, what we've looked at and shown the team so far. Next slide, please. Looking at Southern New England, this is a you know relatively new hotspot for right whales that uh, it ha is is going to be regulated in the final rule for the uh, Northeast trap pot fisheries. These are the images of the gillnet hotspots. The top graph. Uh, sorry, I didn't really orient you on this before, but this shows the monthly hotspots starting in January on the upper left, and at the bottom of each uh, section uh, is December, so it goes through each month, left to right. Um, and you, you see that Southern New England hotspot as well as some areas in Long Island, particularly December through May. The top part of this is the 60% of the risk within Southern New England. Very similar areas show up when we compare the risk for all the coastwide gillnet risks. So much of the gillnet risk uh, along the coast is in this Southern New England area and in those uh, December through May months. Next slide, please. Looking at the uh, mixed species trap pot, hotspot analysis in Southern New England. Similarly, we still see a hotspot December through May um, for the other trap pot fisheries. When we're looking at it coastwide, because a lot of that uh, is being managed under phase one, some of those hot spots uh, are not as evident when we're looking at all of uh, coastwide uh, other trap pot fisheries. Next slide, please. In the mid Atlantic, uh, the hot spots are a little bit patchier, but they're still evident for these are the trap pot fisheries. And you can see December that, um, that uh, Delaware and New Jersey area. Uh, then in uh, January and February, well, January, it spread out uh, almost from Hatteras through uh, Delaware Bay area, and then it concentrates down off of um, off the Chesapeake area and then back up to New Jersey. So uh, that area is not one continuous hotspot, but sort of a series of bands of hotspot. And that uh, same pattern really shows up whether we look at just the 60, top 60% of the risk within all the mid-Atlantic or the top 60% looking at coastwide. Next slide, please. The gillnet hotspots, somewhat similar, particularly if we look at the top 60% of risk within the mid-Atlantic bite uh, or within the mid-Atlantic area, we see that December, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, a little bit more of a spread and it shows up off the Chesapeake Bay as we move from January through April. Um, and that is true. Uh, well, really, when we look at the top 60% of risk for the whole coast, we see that little concentration up in the mid-Atlantic Bay area in December and January. Next slide, please. And the Southeast, we see nearly no trap pot risk at all remaining. That's partly because of black sea bass fishery uh, has a large closure that was implemented by the South Atlantic Council and has removed most of the risk of trap pot fisheries during the breeding season when the cows and calves and other uh, some other right whales are down in that area. Um, gillnet fisheries, we don't 
the top 60% for the Atlantic coast, none of that shows up in the Southeast region. If we look at the top 60% of risk for just the Southeast, we see a little bit of risk, sort of continuing that trend from the mid-Atlantic. It's in the North Carolina, uh, uh, Virginia border, and then down a little bit off of Hatteras. Um, and again, all of this data will be updated with state fisheries, so other areas may emerge as, as we look at uh, better state fishery data. Next slide, please. So again, we provided that to the team more just to start looking like where is the risk that needs to be reduced, start getting a feel for it. We were not looking for recommendations from them yet. We're only looking for brainstorming and things to take to uh, out to scoping. And so I'm going to just quickly go over what the uh, what the ideas that were provided by the team um, for Gilnet. Uh, they provided some ideas towards fishing gear or effort reduction. Those included reducing soak times, restricting overnight soaks for some fisheries, um, increasing the number of nets between buoy lines to reduce the number of buoy lines, evaluating the use of tie downs or uh, shorter um, panels to reduce the amount of gear in the water column that could entangle right whales and other large whales. And then um, they considered looking at a hybrid ropeless gill net where one end was ropeless, the other end would be a weak rope. Uh, just a tagline holding the buoy uh, that was identified more towards something like a monkfish fishery rather than the large volume gillnet fisheries. Next slide, please. For trap pot gear reduction, uh, similar measures as those that were considered in the proposed and, and uh, near near final rulemaking which is uh, to increase the number of traps per trawl to reduce the number of end lines. That was not something recommended for the Southeast calving areas where they're protecting the small calves and the weaker moms uh, that have just calved, where they're looking at having only singles using light pots and weaker line. Uh, trap caps were also identified as something for us to consider or to take out to scoping uh, get to get data on, and that included caps for fish pots, blue crab and whelk fisheries, and really any fisheries that didn't have a cap or wasn't in some way effort controlled. And then uh, we'll be analyzing, extending the measures that will be in the final rule from the phase one rule to the other trap pot fisheries. Next slide, please. Uh, some risk area uh, risk reduction or I'm sorry seasonal restricted areas were also discussed by the team, uh, particularly for existing seasonal restricted areas, uh, which primarily um, outside of southern New England primarily occur in the southeast. Uh, the southeast black sea bass fishery really would like to allow ropeless fishing in that area, so allow the harvest of black sea bass, but not using buoy lines. Uh, there was a suggestion that we reevaluate boundaries and timing, uh, perhaps extend shoulders to capture more months or uh, or look at the um, areas that we are currently managing to see if they still make sense with the shift in the right whale distribution over since about 2010. Uh, they uh, black sea bass fishery, as I mentioned, is closed for uh, seasonally under the South Atlantic Council's. Uh, fishery management plan and there's a recommendation that we add that to or I'm sorry recommendation from some of the southeast folks that we add that to the take reduction plan so that it's covered as well under the take reduction plan uh, it, we were asked to look at potentially rolling area restrictions up and down the mid-atlantic with those hot spots and uh, we were asked to take a look at uh, evaluating a southern new england restricted area next slide please There were also recommendations that we consider um, and get information on possible ideas for expanding gear marking to improve our ability to identify where uh, where entanglements are occurring. And uh, there were suggestions that we make sure that gear marking can let us tell the difference between states or principal uh, principal states, uh, the difference between state and federal fishing, the difference between U.S. and Canadian gear and possibly different gear marking requirements by gear type. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So a number of the topics involved fishing fishery effort management uh, suggestions. Uh, so they're asking us to evaluate um, the effect of cap and latent effort in gillnet fisheries, uh, evaluate the impacts or consider limited entry for open access fisheries. The example that was given was the skate fishery um, that I think the New England Council ha uh, has not yet um, considered a closed access fishery since the data are limited there. Um, uh, they wanted to identify the challenges determining effort and managing the unmanaged fisheries that are caught in some of this same year that is uh, managed under the take, take or extra plan. And also to look at trap caps, reducing soak times, and as I mentioned, uh, minimum maximum numbers of nets on stream. Next slide, please. And then uh, in the proposed rule and, uh, and analyzing the final environmental impact statement, we're looking at requiring weak rope uh, engineered to be weak, break at less than 1700 pounds or weak insertions that create breaking points within the rope in varying places. Uh, and so there was a suggestion that we analyze that as well for buoy lines and gillnet and trap pot fisheries along the coast. There was also a suggestion that we look at a cap line diameter of a half inch uh, or maybe five eighths inch, but the half inch would help to differentiate it from Canadian snow crab and offshore lobster gear, which uh, commonly uses five eighths inch diameter gear. Um, and again, uh, expanding some of the weak insertion requirements in the phase one rule into these uh, trap pot fisheries. And um, in the Southeast, there was a suggestion that um, that we could require weaker weak inserts in the gillnet panels if we could also pair that with a smaller anchor than what's currently required. Next slide, please. So again, we're initiating scoping. It really kicks off tomorrow and we'll be back at your October meeting. Um, we'll also be at the commission meeting later in, in October uh, to you know, get input and answer questions regarding scoping. We would particularly like input from you on Mid-Atlantic Council fisheries, the fisheries that you're responsible for managing. And um, particularly given the, the team's interest in uh, issues that are really effort reduction related, getting either input about latent effort characterization or uh, access or um, anticipated future effort based on the stocks and the status of the fisheries that will help us evaluate some of the measures that they're proposing, such as um, trap limits or, well, if not trap limits, traps per trawl or net panels per trawl, those will not modify or reduce effort if if more sets can be made, if there's no other limits. Or uh, similarly, if we put in uh, fishing effort or, or fishing, you know, no nighttime fishing, but people can put in another third of gear, it doesn't actually reduce effort. So um, we really would like the council and state direct, you know, state fishery managers input on this during scoping so that it can inform the team on what uh, reasonably uh, could, could be reasonably considered to be effective management when they're considering what to recommend. Again, our scoping season is September and October through October 21 and seven meetings. Um, some we will be, uh, they will be, remote and anyone can join us or virtual, anyone can join us, but we will be targeting fisheries and uh, regions. And if any states are interested in scoping this separately, we would be happy to support that either with information slides uh, or we can even um, join and listen in so we can hear what your fishermen are saying, but uh, also we could be available to answer questions. And again, we'll bring the results of the scoping back to the team um, later this winter and early next year to help them start developing recommendations for us to consider for rulemaking. And I think that is it, um, except for taking questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, thanks, uh, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I work for, I, I work for the state of Maryland, so we'll, we'll definitely uh, put some comments in. Um, you know, regarding the the issue, but let me see if anybody has any hands. 
Uh, I did see uh, Peter Hughes had, a, had his hand up. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm on a different set now. Yeah, we can hear you fine. That's good. Okay, great. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Colleen, for the presentation. Um, this isn't the first presentation I've I've seen. And um, I guess during an earlier presentation, I had um, uh, we, we were we were told that stress has a lot to do with um, uh, Atlantic right whale calving. And um, in recent days, recent weeks, I've read a lot of articles about how the the whale, the right whale counts up in the New England um, wind energy areas uh, have increased considerably um, over what they may have been historically. And I'm wondering throughout the range of whales, have you been able to overlay the wind energy areas with the uh, Atlantic right whale migratory patterns, and um, are you are you kind of looking at that through a different lens right now, um, just due to the fact that um, the stress related to female right whales uh, can interfere with their calving? Uh, thank you. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah. Um... Actually, uh, it was forecasted that there would be more large, more right whales in that area before wind energy development was uh, being considered there. And but a lot of the surveys that were done that documented and, and demonstrated that they were there were surveys that were being done related to anticipated wind energy development. So a lot of what we know about the increase in right whale use of that area is from some of the wind energy surveys. Um, so the effort I'm talking about here is really restricted to the part of the MMPA that deals with um, commercial fisheries. Uh, but the impacts of wind energy on right whales is being considered both by our NEPA team and our Section 7 team. And they are looking uh, particularly at the stress of construction. Uh, um, I, I am uh, less familiar with the um, any knowledge about the stress of actual operations or whether it would have an impact on right whales. Uh, but that would be uh, work being done by our Section 7 team and our NEPA folks. I know that uh, the lease sales did go through a Section 7, a formal Section 7 consultation that included conditions to reduce impacts on right whales. Great. Thanks, Colleen. I appreciate your, uh, your, your forthcoming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks, Colleen, for the for the answer to Peter's question. Uh, let me go next to Dewey Hemmelwright, and then we'll come to Chris Batsavage after Dewey. Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the presentation, Colleen. Um, given that this is focused on fisheries, what? And I take it that a percentage of right well. Um, Deaths are caused by fishing gear or proposed to be caused by fishing gear. What's being taken in consultation with the shipping industry, uh, particular to their reduction, meaning number of vessels allowed in the sea to be transversing the area uh, and, and all the other uh, things? You, you know, I'm looking for the parity part here. If fisheries is one part of the equation and answer, uh, what's the other side or the equation and answer and what's being done to restrict um, lim limit uh, and all the above to the shipping industry? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and again, uh, this is limited to that part of the MMPA, but uh, the um, we do have a, a ship speed rule that was implemented in 2008. It was supposed to be temporary, but appeared to be pretty effective. So they, they made it a permanent rule. And last year or early this year, they put out a report uh, analyzing the rule, which suggested that some of the areas um, where we have ship speed requirements, particularly are, uh, their seasonal areas around the harbors, and there are a couple of larger seasonal uh, uh, management areas that have 10 knot uh, rule requirements for large vessels. Um, those are not doing the job as they appeared to be doing uh, earlier on. 
And so uh, NIMS is planning to do another rule to modify the vessel speed areas that are currently in place. And we anticipate that coming out next year, I believe, as a proposed rule. Um, so uh, it, as, as you may have noted on one of our slides, uh, almost all the mortalities that we can get to uh, appear to be human caused. The two causes that we see are um, vessel strikes and fishery interactions. So vessel strikes are a big part of the problem and we are looking at rulemaking. We don't manage the vessels themselves, the operations of the vessels. So we can't limit the number of vessels, but we can implement speed restrictions and those do seem to be effective. Is that the, uh, can I ask one more question, uh, Chairman? Of course, Dewey, go ahead. Uh, yeah, is that, I mean, limiting the speed, is that the only mitigating factor that, that can be done? Because it seems uh, to not be equitable in its representation of uh, uh, protection when you have the fishing industry and the shipping industry. Uh, I was wondering what other avenues are at y'all's disposal besides limiting uh, the, the, you know, uh, the ship speed. Again, we don't really manage the ships, um, but vessel speed reductions, which which vessel operators will tell you do have a big impact on them, um, but they do seem to they do seem to reduce the mortalities based on if we get the areas right where we implement those vessel speed rules, um, based on past evaluations. And that is the main thing being done, it, for instance, in Canada, where they've brought down at least their detected, their observed mortalities caused by vessel strikes in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They have uh, some fixed vessel speed reduction areas, as well as uh, they have some dynamic ones because they have a, a very a high level of um, Aerial surveys right now, when they see whales, they also implement vessel speed restriction areas dynamically, uh, which they can do under their rulemaking authorities. But that's something that's harder for us to do. But vessel speed reduction does seem to be the solution when we know the whales are, are likely to be in the area. Um, so yeah, thanks for that answer, and thanks for that question, uh, Dewey. Let's go. Uh, we've got Chris Bat Savage, and then we'll go to the public after that. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Colleen, for the uh, the presentation uh, last week when you presented ASMSC. I had a question about maybe looking at the the gillnet fisheries by mesh size instead of target species. I, I won't ask that again, but but thinking about. Um, you know, the mid Atlantic uh, managed species, uh, I think bluefish and spiny dogfish are open access permits. Um, so, you know, if there was a, a control date put in to you know, take care of latent effort, um, there, there's always a possibility, actually a likelihood of, uh, of that effort shifting into state waters uh, where federal permits uh, aren't required. Um, has the uh, has the take reduction team thought about those kinds of things or, or is that something that they're going to be looking for through the scoping process? And a second question I have, this is probably more to Chris Moore. Um, uh, is it, I guess, is it appropriate for the council at, during or after scoping to submit comments or is this really the, these kind of updates that we get um, at our meetings, the, the, the best way to, um, provide input as a council to uh, to the take reduction team. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, Chris, I mean, I can I can speak to that, but if you if you'd rather, that's fine. Go oh, ahead, go Chris. Ahead. No, I was going to say, go ahead, Mike, and then uh, I'll follow up. Yeah, I, I, I think that I think that we. We certainly have the opportunity to provide comment, Chris. Um, Chris Bat Savage. Um, and other members of the council, you know, we certainly have the ability to provide that comment. It's what that comment is and whether or not people want to send 
send information into, you know, it's it it's just hard because we, I don't think we have another council. Colleen, when did you say your uh, when the comment period closed? October twenty first. So, Chris, do we have a, do we have a, a, um, I think we meet be between now and October twenty first, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah, we have a meeting okay. the first week. Of yeah, so so if, while instead of me just like rambling on, why don't you just let us know what staff can do uh, as far as comments go? So there's a couple things that we could do. We have, um, as uh, Colleen, hi Colleen, as as she indicated, hi. we have uh, we have Carson uh, who has a staffer serving on the uh, TRT, and certainly we could provide comments. Through Carson, as she continues to work on those particular teams or that team, um, we could uh, notice something for our next meeting in October, have another discussion, and see if we can reach consensus on how we want to address some of the issues that we raised today. Um, I think it's important for us as a council to get the information out to our stakeholders, maybe engage with them through a process or maybe through some of our APs. So I think I think there's a number of things that we could do. Um, Certainly, just thinking about them today uh, is probably not the best uh, approach, but working with uh, Carson, we can get something out to the council and identify a good path for us to take. Yeah, thanks, Chris. No, I appreciate that. Um, any response, Colleen? We would really appreciate that as well. That would be fantastic. Uh, we, yeah. are, we are flipping our process with the team a little bit. The last time, we did the scoping after they developed recommendations. This time we're doing the scoping ahead of time so that we can have this information when we're actually developing recommendations. Um, so I really appreciate anything you can do to help make sure that we have the best uh, fishery management and effort information available to the team when they're making their decisions and to us for our evaluations particularly since the team at this time appears to be uh, identifying a lot of things that are that look like effort reduction, but we may not be able to evaluate that they are effort reduction. Right. So we, we really would like to know that ahead of time. Okay. So Chris, do you think you and I, and maybe Wes, and we can, we can have a, a leader, uh, a discussion about sure. what, what the next steps are. Yeah, so uh, remember too that I think we still have a protected resources committee. Um, oh, yeah, of course. So yeah, um, and that's we, uh, Chris Pat's habit, right? Exactly. That, so, uh, depending, yeah. yeah, depending, depending on, on how the committee assignments go and if Chris continues to, to serve in that role, then a good idea might be to have Carson work with that uh, particular committee and and uh, Colleen and her crew and, and really put some material together that uh, makes sense for everyone. Oh, yeah, so, that's a, that's a great. That's a great uh, recommendation. I think that'd be that'd be fantastic, and we can get something out to, to uh, the service, you know, based on our protect resources committee. It sounds good. And we'd be happy to help with that. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I see a few hands from the public. I'm going to go to the public quickly. Uh, Julie Evans, and then Greg DiDomenico, you'll be next. Go ahead, Julie. Hi, uh, um, thank you so much for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's amazing to be next to these animals, um, and we're lucky in Long Island to have them visit us from time to time. Um, could you tell, talk a little bit more about where you're finding the whales in Long Island? Um, we can maybe go up a couple of slides. Um, so the whale uh, layer of our model comes from the Duke habitat model. And uh, the Duke model considers uh, only uh, the information from surveys that are like appropriate surveys that can be. Um, I think the one before this one actually that you just went by is probably a, a good one. Mm -hmm. Other direction. Um, so, uh, it is based on survey effort and then, uh, as well as habitat conditions that 
suggest that they're suitable conditions for whales. So if you look at uh, this slide, December and January, and it looks like again in May, uh, Long Island's got um, right whales in the near shore. Um, I actually started in protected species and right whales out in Montauk, and the and this was a long time ago after whaling ended, but not by that much. And in the 1980s, <laughs> you know, the fishermen would talk about knowing that their parents would be on observer towers off of East Hampton watching for whales and heading out. So that so there were still fishermen whose parents or grandparents had been involved in a, a coastal whaling fishery off of Long Island. Um, oh yeah. For sure. So I think that, but, that you you know, if you look at that, and it was during the school year is the way they recounted it, it would get them out of school. So if you look at that December, <laughs> January, and May, uh, the model suggests that that's where they are. And um, New York has been really a, a front runner in doing surveys in the last few years. So a lot of that data may be informed by those surveys, although the model at this time has whale data up to 2018, so I'm not sure it has all of the New York data in it yet, and that will be updated as as uh, Duke progresses in developing their habitat model. We would stand on the beach and just watch them jump. I mean, it was amazing. It hasn't been like this that I've seen so far this year, but it yeah, you've got it, a lot of humpback whales as well chasing mullet. I think off of uh, or Menhaden off of Long Island. Yeah, we have a lot of bunker, a lot of yeah. bunker. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Julie. I appreciate your uh, your contribution to the discussion. I'm going to go to Greg DiDomenico. Go ahead, Greg. You're... Hello, Colleen. Can you hear me? I can, Greg. Um, I've been trying to follow up on uh, ever since we had the TRT regarding the issue of more discreet hotspots. Uh, I made some concerns during the last TRT that they're a little general and broad. Uh, is there still some chance to refine that and perhaps go to some other more discrete analysis using? All yeah, the, I think know? right now we have, I think, nearly all of the data, the fish data in the model. And um, it was a lot, it was a lot of data putting in all the state uh, data. I don't know if Marissa is still on. She's one of the people who's been working on the model. Uh, but I think she had to run at 4.30. Um, it did, I am here. You are there. So, yeah. So, it, uh, when will we be able to do some extra runs? I think it was slowing the model down a little bit. Yeah, I have a preliminary run now, and I'm trying to work on the hotspot analyses. But because of, there is a lot of data, it's um, it's been a challenge to get it to run properly. Um, but we will have those soon for Gilnet. Um, we don't quite have it yet for Trap Up, but we will... Um, presumably in the next few weeks. And, and so to let you know, um, as a team member, um, Greg, we will be presenting the updated model probably that first week in November. So as we do new hotspot analysis, they will be used in our scoping, but um, but also the team will get another look at the, at the updated model with all the data in it. And that will be in November before we'll be pulling you back together to start creating recommendations. So at that time, I think that's a place at those meetings we can be looking at um, maybe smaller areas. Yeah, and we will continue to take feedback from everybody if if people have additional refinements they suggest. That would that would be great. Essentially, my refinements um, um, essentially focus on many of the spatial and temporal. Um, so, you know, management that we already have, you know, through the, the mid Atlantic, uh, through the, um, through the CRT. In other words, we've got all these lines and all these, um, designations. It's just not mid Atlantic, Southern Atlantic and new England. Um, there's traditional. Right. Locations that have already been carved up for different type of management that we really need to take a closer look at, because again, uh, just you saying it, saying the mid Atlantic is just not really reflective of all the things that the um, harbor porpoise um, charity regulations it doesn't take. In fact, the harbor um, bottlenose doesn't take to um, uh, take into account the you know the seventy two thirty line. There, there's a lot. Uh, involved that may make this analysis a little bit 
better for uh, putting in meaningful regulations. Right, sure. and we, yes. we are. Go, Maris. Um, I was just going to mention we are in the process of, so we have compiled a lot of those different TRT and fishery management measures, and we're still in the process of sorting through those and trying to work them so that they can be entered into the model. Um, so that is something that we are working on. And, and like you said, it's very complicated and challenging. So it's, it's still a work in progress and we're hoping to get that done by November. Um, and then I will also mention some of these um, maps are broken down as they are just for visualization purposes, because you can't look at the whole coast. Um, so we can always uh, zoom in on certain areas and different management boundaries if, if the team wants us to. Uh, Greg, I would add one thing, and that is we're 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 talking about at a very minimum 60% and um, and 80%, 60 to 80% risk reduction. That's big risk reduction. It's not going to be done by tweaking small areas is what we found out from our New England work, our Northeast work. Um, so uh, we, we can do that, but a lot of what, uh, what we needed to do in the Northeast really was um, look at uh, large, you know, at kind of area wide uh, measures, uh, gear modifications and things like that, that would be resilient to changes in the whale distribution. The, the whales are like the fish, you know, everything is changing distribution right now. So if we refine it too small, we're probably not going to be able to uh, identify sufficient risk reduction. But that's definitely something we would like to analyze with the team so that they can, you know, we can try these different things out and see what risk reduction we get. I just want to caution you that going, yeah, going I, too precise is probably not going to be possible this this round. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. It, it's okay. This is too difficult a topic to articulate to you. Uh, it's not exactly what I was talking about, so it's okay. it's fine. I'll, I'll follow up with you and Burton and, uh, and and everybody else. No problem. Yeah, Thank you for your help. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, Julie, I see your hand still up. Did you, did you have anything you wanted to offer? Before we go, okay, hand went down. Um, so let's bring it back to the council. Any other comments from the council at this point? Um, I'll ask staff, there's, there's nothing that in my notes that indicates that we need to take any action here. Um, it was just more for information and comment. Uh, can I confirm that? Yeah, with that's, staff. That's correct. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So, um, Colleen, thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank and I'm thank you for your patience and being willing to, uh, you know, make uh, changes in your plans. Uh, for the afternoon uh, with Sam having to go before you guys. So I appreciate it. Um, no problem. We have, 